Great. Uh, thank you for joining us. The uh, Columbian Senatorial Board is pleased to have candidates for uh, senator, state senator from the 18th Legislative District. I'm Greg Jane. I'm the editorial page editor, and I will have the other board members introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Colleen Keller. I'm the assistant news editor of the Columbian. I'm Craig Brown. I'm the editor of the Columbian and Columbian.com. And Ben Campbell, publisher and Columbian. And now we'll move on to the candidates. Um, please take one to two minutes, introduce yourself, and explain why you're running for this position. And then we'll move on to specific policy issues. And we'll start with Adrian. Thank you. Well, again, my name is Adrian Cortez. Uh, I've lived in the battleground area since I was six years old. Um, graduated from battleground school district. Uh, my daughters uh, went. Uh, you know, raised my daughters uh, in the battleground uh, area. I still currently live in the battleground area. Uh, I'm a second career public school teacher, specifically a special education. I teach out at Camas High School. Uh, in addition to that, I also teach at the university level uh, in a couple different teacher preparatory programs. So it's really exciting uh, work that I do in terms of trying to get uh, teachers like myself many years ago into a new profession and into the classroom to help fulfill our teacher shortage. Uh, in addition to doing that, I've served for three terms in at the Battleground City Council as an elected official, uh, and I've served for one term as the mayor of the city of Battleground, Washington. And why I'm running is pretty simple. The reason why I serve my community is to make the most impact I can uh, to leave it in better condition than when I originally arrived many years ago. Uh, and that's really the same premise when it comes to why I'm running for state senate, is to have the greatest impact to the greatest number of people. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And Greg? Well, thank you. Uh, uh, appreciate it. I'm Greg Cheney, uh, current state representative for the 18th Legislative District, running for the state senate. Uh, thanks for having me here. I grew up in the battleground area as well. Uh, I um, actually live just down the street from Adrian, so we bump into each other occasionally. Um, uh, raising my uh, two kids there, small kids, uh, still in elementary school with my wife. Uh, and I, too, uh, want to see my community thrive. Um, I want to see it do well. I enjoy that. Uh, I was on the Battleground Planning Commission for a number of years prior to running for elective office. I also served on the board of NAMI Southwest Washington. Uh, what I've concentrated on for the last two years is on mental health and substance abuse, uh, trying to bring some mental health reforms uh, to the state. We passed a couple of laws to do good things in that space. Also, we're looking at affordability, making sure the families uh, are able to uh, deal with the ever increasing cost of taxes and inflation, whether it's on their food or their housing and how we lower those prices for working families. So um, I just honored to be here and uh, happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thanks again to both of you. Um, and I should mention there is a third candidate in this race, Brad Benton. He was not able to make his work schedule um, adhere to any of the suggested times. We, uh, we threw out, and so he declined to meet with us, but we're happy to have the two of you. Um, I want to start with one of the major questions uh, facing all governments throughout the state is uh, homelessness and housing, and the legislature took some strides to try and address that. Uh, this past session, was it enough? What else needs to be done, or did they take the right steps to address that? And we'll start with Greg. Well, I think we took some major steps, uh, but it's not enough. There's more work to be done. So uh, there's a host of things being stood up right now, 24-hour crisis centers. Those are people who are having a mental health or substance abuse crisis. They can be dropped off there. Traditionally, the only place they could accept them uh, for those problems was at an uh, ER. Well, the problem at an ER is that's the most cost-inefficient place to put someone who's uh, have suffering a mental health or a substance abuse crisis. So we're standing up uh, crisis triage centers where there'll still be nursing staff, there'll be still medical in place, but we need to have uh, the resources at those locations so we don't fill up our ERs for say heart attacks and other type of things. So we're standing those up. We brought in- I'm sorry, let me, when you say standing up, you mean they're starting- They're building, building and being, okay. yeah. So one of the big problems, we've also passed legislation around uh, this in the last two years, I'm gonna continue to focus on this, is workforce shortages. We have to reach back into the supply line because the simple reality is that even if we build these facilities, we don't have enough skilled labor, skilled nursing staff, 
uh, skilled EMTs, uh, mental health counselors to actually fill these. So we have to not only build them, but also fill them. We did get uh, Stephanie McClintock and I through the capital budget. We got money to build the new mental health facility going into Salmon Creek. Uh, we also got the money for the juvenile facility uh, out in Brush Prairie uh, with new management in there uh, to stand up both those facilities for adults and uh, youth who are in crisis. Um, there's more to do certainly on that. Uh, we can continue to build, but again, what I'm going to be spending a lot of time on is thinking about how we structure our workforce to reach back into the college level. Do we need to incentivize career paths for education? Uh, for scholarships, things like that, because this is a long-term problem. We, it, we've been in this um, underinvestment of mental health and homelessness and drug addiction for a long time. And so it's going, it, there is no easy, quick solution. This is a long-term solution, but those are kind of the things that I'm thinking about, not only the facilities, we wanna make sure those are here available to our law enforcement and to our paramedics and our fire departments, so they can drop people off, but also to have the workforce then to staff them. Um, if I talked to Lifeline a year and a half ago, they had a beautiful new facility, uh, 15, 18 new substance abuse beds, no staff for them for months. And so again, that's the type of crisis that we're facing, again, needing to facilitate those uh, workforce issues as well. Now, obviously, and as you mentioned, that will require some funding. Yeah. Where does that funding come from? So we've been, uh, we for the facilities, um, we got several hundred million dollars out of capital budget here in Southwest Washington for those facilities that I mentioned. Uh, we also need to look at the operating budget. I think there's bipartisanship really around getting money into the operating budget to incentivize these career paths. We passed bills uh, to um, uh, make it so that if you're moving in from out of state, for example, uh, if you're in the military and you come to Fort Lewis, and you already have a mental health licensure in California, we don't want to put up artificial barriers to, while you've already got an active license in California, let's bring it in quickly if you're a military spouse who can go to work right away and uh, streamline that process to get those out-of-state license processed to work here in our state. So those are the type of things and that a lot of that is going to be operation, uh, capital, so the capital budget is facilities, the uh, uh, other operating budget is where we're going to look at for these workforce shortages and challenges. And I, I think that's a pretty bipartisan issue and approach. All right. Thank you, Adrian. Your thoughts about homelessness and housing? Yeah, well, first of all, homelessness is really, it, it's not just an issue that happens in a vacuum, right? There are so many interconnected points to homelessness. Um, there's, you know, the rising cost of housing. Uh, there's, as uh, uh, Greg said, mental mental health issues that are out there. Uh, there's drug uh, the drug addiction problems that are out there and many, many, many more things. I think, uh, you know, what I, Greg had some really good things that he talked about when it comes to, you know, trying to tackle housing. The problem is, is Greg's party doesn't necessarily align with what Greg wants to do. His party is the party of no. And so even his own opponent, uh, uh, Mr. Benson, that couldn't be here today, uh, was even going after Greg saying, you know what, he works with the other side and that's not what he should be doing. Um, and so his party won't even endorse him for this race. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not sure what he can get accomplished if he's elected. Now, uh, moving forward as mayor of the city of Battleground, one of the things I did, we took a multi-pronged approach when it came to uh, how do we make housing more affordable, right? And so uh, during my tenure, we were able to reduce prop, reduce utility taxes by over 40%, returning $1.5 million to ratepayers. Now that helped not only just homeowners, but that helped renters too as well. And that's helping direct cost, right? Um, I just met with a developer and the Vancouver Housing Authority uh, just recently, and we are gonna be working on a program that the Vancouver Housing Authority hasn't really utilized that much. Uh, to put together a, a um, uh, affordable housing apartment complex in our city. Uh, and it's a very unique program in which Vancouver Housing purchases the land, the developer builds and owns the uh, building on top of the land. And in a high interest rate environment, it works. 
these days, right? And uh, you have a lot of developers and builders that are kind of banging down Vancouver Housing Authority's door trying to get a program like that. So we need to explore how do we give the bank, the housing authorities in the state uh, more tools that they can do programs like that, right? Um, there's how does, uh, perm you know, while I'm very experienced and knowledgeable on the permitting process in cities, uh, are there any legislative tools that they, they can use, they can need, uh, they can help when it comes to reducing housing costs, right? Um, and then there's, you know, the Growth Management Act, right? Uh, are there any legislative um, uh, actions that we can take to provide some flexibility that can provide a uh, pressure relief valve? Uh, when it comes to the Growth Management Act and how it's applied regionally, right? Uh, so, and would you be in favor of that, of adjusting the Growth Management Act? I would be in favor of looking at it, and if and if it made sense, and if we could still accomplish the overall overarching goals of the Growth Management Act while still providing some housing relief, absolutely I would be, uh, without a doubt. Uh, and so, as you can see, it, it it's going to take a multi-pronged approach but that's going to be a new and fresh perspective. And um, let's be real, the, the Democrat Party is going to be the party that's in power after this election. And so I believe my voice is going to be a little bit louder than Greg's but, is. But given that, don't we benefit from having strong dissenting voices against the majority party? Yeah, Dissenting voices are always good, and I can be a dissenting voice, and I will no doubt be a dissenting voice because I'm going to be carrying the uh, the values of Southwest Washington of the 18th District to the Senate, right? But the thing about it is, uh, with Greg's party, his party is a party of no. All they're, they're saying is no. They don't have solutions. It's just voting no. How can I fight against this? How can I stand against this? How can I vote no against this, right? And so I know that's not Greg because he doesn't represent those values, but that's his party. And so he's going to always be fighting his own party in addition to the other party. I want to get back to the, he mentioned the Growth Management Act. Sure. Would you be in favor of changes to yeah. that? Yeah. So first of all, uh, it wasn't my party that blocked the hearing. I had a bill that I proposed and submitted uh, that was basically a rent abatement for small uh, owners who have small units, uh, rental houses, because what we're seeing is, uh, because of the restrictions the Democrat majority has put on the state with more and more uh, rental restrictions on being able to evict for non-payment, things like that, mom and pops runners are saying, listen, it just isn't worth us doing business. So we go into the rural parts, a Brush Ferry, Battleground, a little bit in Yakult, places like that. We don't have enough rentals in the inventory. And you can't just build apartment buildings for Vancouver Housing Authority in those areas. That's not realistic in sight. So I had a bill that would have given tax and rebate incentives to small landowners who have multiple rentals like that. It wasn't my party who didn't give that bill a hearing. They wouldn't even give it a hearing. That was the Democrat majority. So um, so it, it has nothing to do with my party. My party is, is up in Olympia. Um, we are very much about a party of uh, solutions and ideas. Um, so yes, we should be looking at the Growth Management Act. I think one of the things we can do is look at the missing middle. We had the uh, middle housing bill. Um, I had some concerns on that bill. Ultimately, I voted no on middle housing because I thought that it wasn't the right fit for the district, given the amount of homes that we already have built and the tightness. So in the city of Battleground, there was a transit-oriented development bill in the state legislature. It came out very bipartisan out of the Senate. Uh, but the problem with it in Battleground was it said, listen, you have to do transit-oriented, that's high-density housing, within about half a mile of the West Stop. Well, that would have encompassed almost the entire city limits Battleground. I don't think that was the intent of the bill, but that's why part of these bills I ended up saying no on is because they weren't fitting for the district. And so I do think there are places we can look at high density. Certainly Hazeldale is one of them, Orchards maybe, depending on transit quarters. But I think we also need to be care uh, careful um, about about how we do these things within the Growth Management Act. I do think a regional approach to Growth Management Act is good. Um, as some of you know, I became very concerned. We had already released 5,000 new uh, homes to be built up around the 179th interchange. The governor's budget, he'd already, in previous years, the governor had allocated $50, $50 million for that. 
um, that went to zero. There was not even maintenance money for the 179th interchange. And so when I became alerted to that, I immediately reached out to both my uh, Democrat leadership on the transportation as well as the Republican leadership, said, hey, this is a priority. We've already, you've already committed 50 million. Now it's been taken down to zero. We've got 5,000 homes. Clark County is already putting 20 million into this project and you just zeroed it out. We've, we've relied on your commitment. So we actually did was not only increase it from, it went from 50 to zero, I was able to raise it back up to 86 million to adjust for the cost of inflation of construction to make sure that the state had that money aside, put aside to build, rebuild the 179th. Because what would have been a horror is if we had allowed 5,000 homes already to go in there and then not had the 179th interchange to be rebuilt, it would have been a failed interchange with zero dollars for improvement or maintenance. So that's what I look at when I when I think about these things. So absolutely, the GMA has to be looked at within the context of smart growth. That's what we need to be doing. That's what we need to be focusing on. But that includes transportation. That includes the mental health facility. So as we have a growing part population in Southwest Washington, we need to ensure that we have the proper mental health facilities, things like that. So that's when I, I look at a systems approach uh, when I look at these policy problems. Great, thank you. Colin? Uh, let's talk about schools. What uh, should the legislature be doing to address uh, some of the continuing concerns where public schools are concerned, something I'm sure Adrian is <laughs> deeply immersed in, but uh, as we're seeing uh, enrollments drop, uh, but still issues with budgets and then concerns, like in, we've seen a couple of our school districts who just cannot get bonds passed uh, because of the supermajority, is that something that also the legislature should address? Is that 60%? Should that be altered in some way? Or it, it, some of the big issues facing schools, what are, do you feel the legislature should be doing where public education is concerned? And Adrian, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure. I'll, I'll try to tackle those one at a time. I know uh, Greg will probably disagree with me on this, but uh, when when you require a 60% supermajority to pass something, in my opinion, that's undemocratic, right? Uh, Greg or I are not going to require a 60% supermajority to get elected as senator. We require 50% plus one, right? And so why are we requiring uh, the ability to build our schools and the local community to vote in favor of those uh, bonds? Uh, why do we make it harder and make that threshold harder? Uh, so yes, that will be one of my priorities is um, how do we um, uh, overcome that challenge? Now, it's going to most likely require a constitutional amendment uh, to uh, um, tackle that particular topic. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, the Democrat majorities will increase this election cycle so we can make that happen uh, and, and make it more fair uh, when it comes to how we fund and build our schools. Uh, in the state, to get on the ballot, does a constitutional amendment require two thirds of each chamber, or just a majority? Um, under my understanding, it does, but I may be wrong on that. Do you so. know offhand? I I I don't know offhand. I'm just I, curious. I, I have. I, I just I assume, but I don't. Want to I, I thought it'd be that. ironic if it requires two thirds to yeah. vote on a sixty yeah. percent supermajority. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, regardless of what that action is, it, I, I want to make make that well known and make that voice well heard that what do we have to do to make some progress on this? Secondarily, uh, when it comes to uh, state schools in general, you know, general education, if you look at the past probably eight to 10 years, uh, the amount of money that goes into state education, right, has actually declined anywhere between eight to 10%, depending on where you're looking at. Now, we did have COVID, right? And so a lot, we have some missing federal money that's no longer there, but still, we are still in a declining uh, phase in terms of the amount of money that the state appropriates for education. And when our constitution says that education is a paramount duty, uh, to me and to most people, that means it's the highest priority. And it's not getting the highest priority when it comes to our how the way we're funding it. Now, I was excited to see as a special education teacher, I was excited to see some progress 
in uh, how we fund special education during the last legislative session. I'm not sure how uh, Representative Cheney at the time voted, uh, but I was excited to see that that forward progress. However, we're so far behind when it comes to special education, right? It was actually just front page uh, in the Columbian this morning uh, on special education and how we're not getting enough qualified teachers in the classroom that know how to deal with, you know, how do you deal with disreg uh, uh, students that are dysregulated? How do you how do you uh, put together uh, spe uh, uh, specialized designed instruction for a student, right? How do you understand, you know, what a you know functional behavior assessment is or a behavior intervention plan is? We were we're throwing uh, unqualified teachers in the classroom. And I, I can speak from experience as a teacher that uh, not only is a special education teacher and department head for special education, but also somebody that teaches uh, for three different teacher preparatory programs, right? And so uh, we need to increase our capacity in which we can get more qualified special education teachers in the classroom. So that may require uh, some additional funding or even some of the way we uh, look at certification, right? And so um, now the next question might you might ask is, OK, so where do we get that funding from? Well, I'll tell you where we don't get that funding from, and that's uh, cutting some of the revenue sources that we have right now. You know, right now, the capital gains tax is going to be going before the public. Uh, I think it's a terrible idea to get rid of it because uh, that is uh, a major funding source for education in general and special education. Um, and so uh, I think most Washingtonians uh, at the end of the day and at the ballot box will agree with my opinion and that we need to keep uh, that capital gains tax in place to pay for important aspects of our society when it comes to education and special education. Craig, what's your views on when it comes to the supermajority and then just sure. funding in general? Sure. So first of all, when we talk about funding in general, uh, the House Republican Caucus actually put forward an amendment on the operating budget to spend several hundred million additional dollars on special education in particular. Unfortunately, that amendment was voted down by the majority of the state house. So uh, we are certainly, uh, as a caucus, highly aware uh, of the need to fund at an appropriate level special education. Um, I think that is a critical component. Certainly that is something, as I talked about a few minutes ago when I talked about the mental health issues and challenges, that is absolutely on my mind. Is In my view, every dollar that we invest in early intervention, whether or not it's autism therapies or whether or not it's in a treatment intervention, different types of uh, modalities of therapy, the earlier in uh, we can invest and intervene uh, with a young child, the better the outcome is going to be. And I also believe that it's likely to save money down the road by that early intervention. So that's something that is always on the forefront of my mind when we think about these things. You know, I, I would contextualize a little bit different um, uh, this issue of, of Ridgefield in particular in their school bond passage. You know, I think it is worthy to have a talk about what is the right appropriate balance. But what we need to remember is school bonds are a 30 year taxpayer obligation. In other words, when you vote in a state representative or a state senator, the longest you're voting them in is for a four year term. And if you don't like them at 51%, you can kick them back out. But what we're talking about here is a long term 30 year bonding obligation on a property owner and potential generations of property owners. So I think that we have to have a, a conversation. I think it's a worthy conversation about whether or not 60% is the right. Uh, maybe it should be a little lower. I think I said I was open to having that discussion uh, of a lower number uh, uh, a couple of years ago when I was in front of your uh, board before, and my position on that hasn't changed. But I also think it is problematic to go with a simple majority. In other words, if you were going to elect one of us for 30 years, maybe it would be better to have 51% if you knew that person was going to be sitting in the office for the, for the next 30 years. So I think there is a good conversation there. I also... In the back of my mind, I wonder, well, is there an education component or what is missing in the Ridgefield example um, at, at a failure at 59 percent? Um, are they seen to be using their monies efficiently or wisely at a leadership level? Um, and so, again, these are very unique situations around different school districts. I realize that. But it also uh, the, the, the business owner and the lawyer in me wants to say, well, wasn't there a way to get that extra 0.03% for, for that bond passage? And why was that 0.03? Is it an educational piece? Um, what is it? 
So uh, I think, you know, again, we, when we look at uh, the educational system, I think we got a lot of work to do. I think there is a declining enrollment. Uh, that money is going to go away if folks are no longer enrolling in the schools. Um, I think we it would behoove us to study why folks aren't enrolling in our public schools right now. I also think there's small things we can do, uh, like look at cell phones. Are cell phones turning into more of a disruption? Obviously, we want kids in an emergency situation to have access to their cell phone. There was a bill uh, by my seatmate, uh, Representative McClintock, about what to do about the cell phone problem. And I think we've even seen some re more recent literature uh, that parents are beginning concerned about how much their kid is waving around the cell phone during the instructional time. One of the other things we heard from teachers and, and paraeducators was the terrible pay of paraeducators. What we know, and I've talked to them, many of them, uh, is that their pay is barely uh, above minimum wage, and it is certainly what I would consider a poverty level. We have to increase paraeducator pay. Why? Because they are critical to that function of that classroom. They can help the kid who's having a hard time, either emotionally or, or academically. Um, but if we want paraeducators to come into the system and really be able to help the classrooms, then we have to be able to pay them appropriately. And so I think that's one of the components we can look at for that additional support in the classrooms. Um, I also think we can look at what to do about disruptive students. Um, we heard from many teachers and committee hearings about how uh, if you have one student being disruptive, potentially you have to remove the entire classroom. Is there a way to humanely move the one disruptive child to somewhere safe and appropriate, uh, but maybe not move that entire classroom out of the hallway? So I think there's things that we can do there. Uh, certainly, in, I'm in favor of increased training for those situations. My mom was a 30-year teacher before she retired. I know it's tough in the classroom and getting tougher by the day because uh, kids are, um, I substitute taught too, kids are are difficult, I think, and, and I think that is partly because of COVID, I think, and being at home for a couple of years and maybe learning or, or not learning uh, decorum, classroom decorum, but we've got a lot of work to do, but I think these are all things we can look at uh, in, in, a, in a manner that is good for our students, good for our school districts. But again, it's a system. There's not one singular issue that we're going to be able to touch and say, this is the solution to the special ed crisis. This is the solution to the buildings crisis. We have to look at these things in all encompassing, and that's the type of perspective I bring. I'm curious, uh, uh, talking about a cell phones in class or yeah. disruptive behavior yeah. in class, how much of that should come from Olympia? How much of it should be up to individual districts? Well, I think that with the disruptive students, I think there's liability concerns and liability shields. I think the only way that to get the liability right, so the school districts or individual teachers, we don't want to have a teacher being sued because if they're trying to you know, uh, maybe touch a kid, uh, not, you know, to, to move them out or over or away from another student. Obviously, we have to look and make sure that if the teacher is uh, using the appropriate level of uh, physical restraint to move the child out of the way, um, that they can't get sued for that. I think that is something that has to come from Olympia. I don't think that's appropriate uh, for individual districts to deal with. Um, I also think that we can look at how we deal because again i agree that that education at the supreme state supreme court has said it is our paramount duty as a state and the state budget and state funding and we have to look at how these systems we have in pleasant valley a, a school with a that desperately needs a new roof the roof is failing okay on that school the problem is if you replace the roof right now you're going to have a beautiful 30-year roof yet the infrastructure the walls the, the physical space is still going to have to be replaced in the next couple of years. So if you replace a roof, that will be great, only to have to then gut it and effectively lose your investment because you know you're going to have to replace those walls and the and the infrastructure within that building as well. And so these are things I think that Olympia can really look at. Well, well one of the things we heard when we brought down the chair of the Capital Budget Committee and the ranking member of the Capital Budget Committee earlier this summer for a tour of both Lauren and Pleasant Valley we heard over and over that inflation, the cost of inflation, the cost of goods is going sky high. It was, I believe the number was between 900 and 1100 per square foot to build new schools right now. That's up from like 800 a couple of years ago. 
400 several years before that. And that's that inflation is not due to any local issue. That's across almost all industries. But we're seeing these enormous skyrocketing inflationary pressures. And I think there is things the state can do in terms of state budget to help school districts within these within these parameters to deal with a skyrocketing inflation that is no fault of the school district. I have to say something really quick. There are no difficult children. There are just teachers and staff that need to be properly trained, right? Um, you know, children are, students are geniuses. You just need to know how to be able to inter intervene with them, how you, how you can be able to apply uh, uh, intervention supports with them. Um, so I disagree with Mr. Cheney on that. And when it comes to, you know, the whole 30 year aspect, uh, you know, I think he his comparison to an elected official versus a 30 year bond is a bit disingenuous. Uh, Mr. Cheney probably has a 30 year mortgage. I got a 30 year mortgage. Most people that have a house have a 30 year mortgage. And so it's very common to have a 30 year mortgage on a building uh, that you finance. Right. And so I think that that equation is uh, a bit uh, lost. And a very poor argument on that goes. But but, you know, when Mr. Cheney talks about, you know, uh, education and, you know, what we should be doing on cell phones, uh, and intervention programs, things of that nature. I'd like to ask, where did Mr. Cheney get his educational degree? Because I the last I heard he doesn't have one. Uh, you know, listen, there are there are right and wrong ways in which you should um, uh engage in proper classroom management, engage in proper curriculum instruction. Uh, trust me, I teach new teachers this all but the time. How much of that should be uh, dictated by Olympia? How much should be up to individual? How much should be local control? Yeah, I think the majority of it should be local control. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sorry, Greg, do you want to? Well, I mean, I think we all know the one you sell your house on a 30-year mortgage, the homeowner doesn't take over that mortgage, the homeowner gets the mortgage. That was a disingenuous argument. Colin, did you have a follow-up? Uh, just uh, quickly, uh, as Adrian had noted that the capital gains tax, that money is helping fund early childhood education, other education sorts of things. And these concerns that you've been talking about, Greg, also everything requires money. Yeah. Where do you stand on the capital gains initiative then? Well, I think the capital gains initiative, I, I'm not convinced that it's necessarily going to pass. Um, uh, I understand there's macroeconomic arguments in, in that could be in favor of it, but um, I, I'm less concerned about that passing. I think what, what we have, the state budget has grown to almost $80 billion over the past 10 years or so, and that has been well before the capital gains was ever put into place because that capital gains tax is a very new tax relative to the last couple of years. And so my view is there is when you're doubling the state budget over the last 10 or so years, there's plenty of money in the coffers. The question is how do you allocate them? And I think at $80 million for the for what I agree is education um, is a paramount duty. I think we have the budgetary wherewithal to be able to deliver those good high quality services for education. Um, that is uh, not necessarily dependent on capital gains money because that capital gains money is only barely beginning to come into the system in terms of the implementation, the actual taxes. Uh, we've, we've been uh, operating without that tax for years and years and years. So um, I, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think it's not going to pass and it's, it's going to be a new issue or the initiative is not going to pass and it's going to be an issue. I'd just like to point out, Mr. Cheney didn't answer your question whether he supports it or does not. I was very clear that I support the capital gains uh, tax as it exists. He kind of walked around the issue. I think there are I think there are concerns among. So I'm I'm a small business owner. I am uh, an attorney to small businesses and there are concerns within family owned businesses. I'm not talking about traders because you still have stock stock capital gain stock from corporations that are privately held by small businesses. That means a family, maybe even the Columbian might be in this position. I don't know what their structure is, but there are family owned businesses that have capital gains and the, and those capital gains taxes on family owned businesses, I think are concerning and potentially detrimental to those smaller family owned businesses. I'm far less concerned about whether or not the CEO of a massive corporation gets capital gains tax. I am concerned when it comes to small family owned businesses and how their corporate structures are impeded 
or not by capital gains. So are you in favor of Initiative 2109? Uh, I am in favor of reform, not necessarily Initiative 2109 as it's written. Are you in favor of 2109, yes or no? Uh, no, not as written. Okay. You aren't in favor of the initiative, so you would leave the capital gains? I believe the capital gains has to be adjusted. I think it's right to do it either by initiative or by the legislature, but I think it has to be adjusted to take account for family-held businesses. Okay, I'm still not clear on where you stand on 2109, what? but that's okay. Will you vote for 2109? I doubt. So you haven't decided. Uh, I, I am leaning on voting against it, but I'll decide as it gets closer because I, again, I want to see part of why I'm part of why I'm hesitating is I think I think we have seen in Oregon the initiative process play out in very odd ways. Now these initiatives. Um, I think it was good that the police pursuit initiative came before the legislature and we voted in favor of it. We passed it so that the, the police have the ability to go out and do reasonable pursuit. I think that's entirely appropriate. What I am concerned about is about initiatives to take a, I tend to be a very nuanced person and a very detailed person. That's partly driven by my education, my law degree. And what I don't like to see is a broad, soft, broad sword that comes in and and doesn't deal with the nuance like a family owned business like and that that is a problem that when the uh capital gains before i was in the legislature was passed but i'm also concerned that using broad swords of initiatives on particular issues is not necessarily the way no, to I, go i, I don't understand that I, to be honest i find it hard to believe that that it, you've been dealing with budgets for yeah. two years and it, it well versed on on the state finances. I, I, I find it hard to believe that you haven't made up your mind. No, I, I'm sorry, I should have been clear. I, I am not likely to vote for it. I'm not intending to vote for it at this point. Okay. Unless there is some major macroeconomic reason that suddenly becomes apparent, I'm, I'm unlikely to vote for it. Um, and it, then uh, while we're on the topic, then what about the other major initiatives, uh, the Climate Commitment Act, uh, I-2117? Uh, how are you going to vote on that? Yeah, the Climate Commitment Act needs to stay in place. Okay. Right. Uh, Greg, your thoughts on that? Uh, no, it's driving up the cost of gasoline. It's driving up inflation. Farmers are now having to pay huge prices on diesels. They weren't given the exemption for it that they were promised under the bill and by the governor. They are paying. It is driving inflation across our entire supply supply chain. I do think we absolutely need a clean environment. I think we should have a clean environment, uh, but I don't think that putting uh, that on the backs of the working class. You know, not everyone can afford a new electric car like Adrian. For those who um, can't afford that, it's not fair to the working folks to be able to put a 30, 40, 50% premium on there. I think there's other things that we can do to transition to clean environment and clean energy. Absolutely, we should do that. But I don't think that putting it on the backs of the working poor or the working class, not the gas pump is the way to do it. Well, see, that's that's the typical MAGA response right there, right? Again, there is no Republican party, it's the MAGA party, right? And so that's a typical Republican or MAGA response. Look, this is where him and I, very much disagree on that. Inflation is not being driven up because of the CCA. Inflation is being driven up nationwide on greater um, greater things that are at play, right? And I think most people understand that, right? So to say that somehow the CCA is driving up inflation is, I think, a red herring, right? And yes, I have an electric vehicle. I also have uh, solar panels on my house, and I have an electric lawnmower. You know what? That's my choice. And I'm very passionate about what I can do to help the environment. And you know what? I'm also saving money at the same time, which is a pretty good conservative and, aspect. And in, in 2035, should Washingtonians have a choice to buy a gas powered car? A new gas powered car? I think they should have a choice, yeah. Okay, so you disagree with the governor's initiative on that? I, I, do, I do, and it's not the first time I disagree with the governor. When the governor, when I was chair of the CTRAN Board of Directors, 2019-2020, uh, and we we're talking about the bridge, right? The governor, uh, the, governor Inslee and the governor Brown of Oregon were both very adamant on having light rail on that new bridge. I actually drove up to the governor's office and I said, look, 
we are heavily investing in BRT. It's actually, it was front page of the, reflect, uh, the reflector, uh, on my stance on that. I said, we're heavily invested on BRT when it comes to our mass transit. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't see light rail to be part of that solution, right? If you wanna put the infrastructure in there, fine. If some future uh, generation, 10, 20, 30 years down the road wants to light it up, fine. But right now, we're heavily invested in BRT, and we're continuing to invest in BRT. So I have no problem. I've disagreed with the governor on many times. Okay, let's move on, Craig. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the budget. So uh, state budget has grown quite a bit. So it's been uh, uh, windfall after windfall. Uh, uh, now the latest revenue forecast looks a little more negative. Mm -hmm. So um, assuming that comes to pass, would you look to uh, increase revenue by... Uh, Increasing taxes and fees, or would you uh, look to reduce the expenditures, or would you find some other solution? Uh, Adrian, you want to start with that? Yeah, so the state revenue has actually come in uh, multiple times. The forecasts have come in very, very healthy, right? And it's kind of similar to like the city on the city level. Uh, ever since COVID happened, uh, a, a, a unique phenomenon has happened, right? Our sales tax revenue has shot up through the roof. Right, it, to the point where it's one of the highest revenue sources in our community, and it's consistently stayed there. And on a state level, it's done the same thing, right? And so, in a healthy economy, um, I think we have the necessary resources there to weather the storm. We have good reserves on a state level, right? I'm not necessarily in favor of looking at new revenue sources right off the top of the bat, right? What 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 can we do to prioritize the obligations that we have, right? As we get years down the road and that situation doesn't change, then obviously I'd be open to looking at, okay, what do we have to do to address this problem? But right now it's way too early because it's not a problem that I see. Great. Yeah, so I think we can look at uh, reducing and tightening our belts. I think when you have 10 years of growing budgets, you can always find some way to gain efficiencies. Um, again, 40 billion up to 80 billion, um, I'm sure that we can find a way to cut and save a little bit of money in there. So one revenue cycle, um, I don't think that uh, we, we, we can do belt tightening for that. But I think the larger issue here, and I think you heard it, is I, I believe right now in Washington, and, and by the way, gas prices in Washington, because the CCA tax are some of the highest in the country right now, uh, it's higher than our, our or across the street in Oregon. And again, this comes back to, yes, inflation is being driven at a nationwide level, but it is being particularly driven in Washington. You talk to the farmers out in eastern Washington, they're paying higher diesel rates. They were promised exemptions under the CCA that haven't been issued yet by the Department of Revenue. So what we need to do is we need to look at how do we help our working families who are struggling? How do we do that? And I think one of the ways you do that is commit to not raising taxes on families. And so that is something I'm uh, very conscientious of. I'm very concerned that, um, that when we look at the CCA, again, we can't all afford. There, I think there are ways to incentivize to a smart transportation grid, a clean energy grid, but I think we have to do it to your question about do we ban a diesel automotives or, or cars, uh, combustion engines in 2035. I think we can do, we can naturally get people to buy hybrids by electric through tax rebates, but we should not hurt those who can't afford to do that we're maybe working a minimum wage. There's soon going to be a toll across the I-5 bridge that's coming in. They're going to have to pay that too. They're going to have to pay gas taxes to get over to a minimum wage job in Portland. That to me is not sustainable, not when our families are struggling. And so I think we have to look at that. I think right now, the best thing we can do is, you know, we can we can hold back on the on the state budget. If we're talking 10 years of growth, doubling the state, I'm sure we can find a couple hundred million to cut out of it without, without upsetting the apple cart. Now, along those lines, I'm curious, earlier you, you mentioned the capital gains taxes. Fairly new. We got by state budget-wise for years without it. What about but the Climate Commitment Act is fairly new. Doesn't yeah. it take some time to see how it's going to play out? Well, we know it's already playing out in the pocketbook of price. I mean, that's why we have some of the highest gas price in the country. So it's already playing out in people's... Well, we already have some of the highest... Gas prices now, well, sure, but look at how much you're paying at what 40, 50 cents a gallon of tax right now. So that's that's much higher than any other state right now. So my point is this: if you are going to continually raise the cost of goods and the cost of living in the state, that to me, I, I take a very 
Uh, my parents were uh, lower middle class, would be the best way to describe it. I'm very proud of my upbringing uh, in the battleground area. Uh, I love what my parents did, but there wasn't a lot of extra money floating around the family household. Um, and so I tend to look at it, what am I doing to make sure that a family can make a decent living wage job in this district? Am I bringing in employers who want to grow here, who build here, who do, who, who can set up a good business? Can they pay their employees good wage? If the employee is getting a less than good wage, are they struggling to put gas in the car? And so all of these things, I think I'm really concerned about the cost of living. It's, you know, it's true. It isn't just any one thing, but let's find relief where we can find it for our working families. But I will say this, you cannot find one bill that Mr. Cheney has sponsored that has directly reduced the tax burden of Washingtonians. It doesn't exist. There's not one. Now, as mayor, I've already told you, we did actionable uh, steps to help your average person, right? We reduced our utility tax rate by 40%, returning over one and a half million dollars to ratepayers. We passed balanced budgets that weren't only just balanced, but had reduced property tax millage rates because we had a growing economy. We were spreading uh, the um, the cost among all battleground units. Um, we reduced, we eliminated the car tab fee in the city of Battleground. We passed the only city that passed. We passed a resolution uh, saying that we are not going to have a local income tax in our city limits, right? And um, we did a lot of fiscally responsible measures that went right into the pocketbooks. Clear documentation. We invested more in police and our roads. You could go online to the city of Battleground and see the state of the city address that I did. It identifies all the things we did. And that was just in my my uh, first term as mayor of the city of Battleground. Now, uh, Greg, have you sponsored any bills that directly lower taxes? Um, I, 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 I'm i sure I've done at least a couple because mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of, of tax, especially at a time of hyperinflation. So I, I can go back and look at my record, but I, I don't, I think whether or not I uh, have sponsored a bill isn't necessarily as important as how I voted on tax bills. And I voted against numerous tax bills in the House. So I think that's a little bit of a red herring argument. Thank you. Ben? Yeah. Uh, so what, if anything, can be done about the high cost of child care in Washington? Uh, sure. So I think, first of all, we need to look at siting uh, regulation requirements because oftentimes what we're finding is these facilities, early uh, childhood facilities and others are being cited in suboptimal locations. So I think that's something that we can work with our cities and counties on to get siting. Uh, ideally, we're going to have siting that is for these facilities that is close to where a parent is working, because if we can reduce that transactional cost of a parent driving across the town to pick up the child, driving back, uh, the waste of gas that is, if we can if we can merge those two things together, or uh, childhood facilities at workforce training locations, so that a person can drop off their child and then go and in, into a uh, uh, you know Clark College and take classes to be able to gain additional skills, we can do that. I think there's certainly a role for uh, lowering uh, B&O taxes on those facilities. So they're almost operating, if you will, like a nonprofit, right? Where they can have all of their money go into the operations and payroll for those employees who, so they can expand that offering. Um, I think we can also look at grants from the state. Again, I am a big believer that every dollar that you invest early in a child's education or future or, or uh, skill set is a greater dollar of investment that you get out, and it's less money you ultimately have to pay to that child or for that child's help uh, later on down the road. So I think these are all things we can look at, uh, citing tax rates for the, for the business, grant funding to help. Um, one of the things I'm concerned about as we look at these facilities and the cost, rising cost of childcare is, if you will, a desert. That is, there's no, uh, nobody who's willing to come in and actually set up a facility in a particular location. I think that's where the state can come in with grant funds and say, hey, if you're willing to come in, you nonprofit are willing to come in, we're going to help you build out that facility. We're going to help you staff that facility. Um, I think those are all appropriate roles because what we know is, and I think we should also look at giving employers tax incentives on payroll taxes 
if they are willing to help cover the cost of their employees' childcare. Because what we know is, particularly with women in the workforce, that's one of the major issues with women not coming back into the workforce, is not knowing what to do with their children, particularly before they start school age. Um, I know it was a struggle for my wife and I. Um, I know it's a struggle for many families. And so to the extent that the state can help facilitate these things and partner, partner with uh, private business to make these things work, either in the locations of them or in tax incentives, um, absolutely. I think there's a host of things we can look at to try to drop that cost because we know it's important. We know the families uh, need help with that child care. And I think there's not one solution, but there's several different solutions we can look at to try to rate, lower that uh, cost burden in families. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to know that Greg supports the capital gains tax, uh, even though it took a while to get it out of him, because that's a revenue source that is going to be important in the future to pay for some of the things that Greg just talked about. Look, um, child care in our county in particular has a waiting list on it, right? Uh, not enough. Uh, child care providers. And why is that? Well, there's two main issues about that. Uh, the average uh, salary for a child care provider is about 34000 And a child care director, it's about closer to 40000 That is anemically low. That's not even, that's not a, a living wage, right? But yet, you know, we're not providing any support for that. So we have to increase the pay for child care provider facilities so they can function, they can be profitable, right? Then we have to also provide the subsidy for the parents, right? Parents, I mean, some of, some of the cost to send their children, just one child to for child care is greater than their mortgage payment. So, I mean, how can parents afford to do that? So we have to provide them a subsidy too to be able to do that because you know what, it's not um, it's not an either or kind of scenario, meaning, you know, hey, if we, you know, help out the child care providers and bring up their wages, and if we, you know, provide a subsidy, then you know what, we got to cut something over here. No, because when you do both of those, as Greg said, you unleash the economic potential of those parents, and they're able to go into the workforce. They're able to be more productive. They're able to uh, spend more money, which increases economic viability for the entire state, right? And so um, I think we need to tackle it from a two-prong issue. And But the most important thing, and this is that a uh, couple hundred million dollars that Greg said that he could find by cutting the budget, uh, we can use some of that money uh, to, you know, direct towards child care, right? And tackle the two-prong issues that I just proposed. Cool. Um, touched on it a little bit, Adrian, about the I-5 bridge. Uh, where do each of you stand on that? And is the legislature, do you anticipate uh, any changes in the approach toward the, the bridge place of project as happened years ago with the Columbia River crossing? Do you feel legislature is really on board with the I-5 bridge? Uh, and personally, as, as, as senators, how would you feel with the I-5 bridge and Greg, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, I'm very concerned again about the tolling because the impact it will have on working families. So the toll zone, as I understand it, starts just south of SR 500 and includes um, all of the downtown Vancouver exits, the SR 14 eastbound exit. And I'm concerned that if Oregon uh, decides to put those toll booths, I know they're saying they won't uh, put them on the north side of the river, but if they do, I'm concerned that they're going to cap, uh, going to draw in a huge swath of commuters that aren't actually using the bridge. So I'm very concerned about that. I also am deeply concerned. I could put forward a couple of amendments and a bill for common sense things. Listen, we're already paying for those folks who are driving across the river to work. They're already paying Oregon income tax. So why can Oregon in Oregon not give an income tax offset to folks who are also paying a toll for the privilege of working over on that side of the river um, to try to delay right now? Uh, folks may not know that uh, the tolling is coming in in 2026. That's the latest information. But at the same time, we don't know when construction is going to start. So at the speed at which the federal and state governments, two state governments and the feds may work, we may well be beyond 2026 before there's a shovel of dirt moving. And I'm deeply concerned about what the uh, cost to the consumer is 
when there's nothing being built and yet they're paying tolls starting in 2026 for that delay. So again, saying let's pause tolling once the bridge is built, let's go ahead and start the tolling at that point if and when. Again, these are ways to mitigate what I think is a major problem for working families on the tolling. Um, I also am concerned uh, about the fact that we've heard estimates, uh, 50, 60% of the money from tolling may go for the administrative cost. Uh, this is from Oregon estimates, the administrative cost of actually administering the tolls. If that's true, I'm also concerned about that. I, I, that is, um, I think, again, unworkable for working class families. The reason I'm so concerned about this is one of my first jobs out of high school was actually working as a cashier in Jansen Beach, making minimum wage. Uh, across uh, the river there. And so my, my also my dad drove uh, to, uh, a cons he was a foreman at a facilities maintenance foreman um, and he drove every day to Portland. So I'm very concerned about what this will mean for our working families and how do we offset that cost for working families. Um, and so I think that I would like to also uh, look at a third bridge, not because we need one right now, um, but because, you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, we, you, this is how long a mega project takes, right? So it's not that there's some magic solution, but let's build a third bridge right away. And that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is serious planners, by, uh, by state planners sitting down and saying, listen, with a population growth that we anticipate coming 30, 40, 50 years down the road, do we need to look at a third crossing? I think the answer to that is yes. Yet nothing right away because I don't think that's realistic, but I do think that's worthy of at least a conversation with our partners in Oregon. Um, I think that uh, at this point, I, I do appreciate the federal dollars coming in uh, on the bridge project. Um, hopefully it gets started sooner rather than later. The other thing I'd say about it is one of the things that I've been focusing on for the past two years is making sure that our employers are ready with a workforce. So we know, for example, that what the estimates are, there's at least 5,000 jobs that we are short of for that bridge construction, meaning we are going to need at least 5,000 more workers for various components to the bridge construction. So how do we as employers within Washington and Oregon, do we have the skilled labor set up? Do we have the employee training program set up? Do we have the apprenticeship set up so that we've got that skilled workforce so that we can grow them and keep them here after that project is complete to grow our workforce rather than short term import those workers from, say, Idaho, Utah, California, that they're just going to disperse back to as soon as the project is done. So that's one of the things I'm talking to larger employer employers about in the region is how do we make sure that you are growing those training cadres of skilled workers so that we can have good jobs, long term jobs that we know the bridge is going to need. And so that's part of what I spent a lot of time thinking about. And what do you see the legislature's role in that? Well, I think we can certainly, yeah, I think in terms of the training, I think there's absolutely training grants we can do. There's uh, tax credits for training. Right now, I keep emphasizing the training because we're obviously not at a construction phase. But what we know is it's several, it takes several years to grow up uh, uh, and train very skilled labor in these highly particularized jobs, whether it's steel fabrication, whether it's concrete, whether it's aggregate, all of these other things that we're going to need, um, those are going to take years to get folks to that high quality level of performance. So we've got to be planning right now how to get those people into that job training stream so that when that bridge is ready to go, we've got a skilled workforce that's ready to go on day one. Okay, Adrian. Yeah, listen, we just uh, we just spent the past five minutes of Greg talking and he did not provide you once did he say that he supports or does not support the I-5 bridge, right? When I'm elected to the Senate, I'm going to give you straight answers and I'm not going to take a long time to give those straight answers. Of course, I right? support an I-5 bridge. Okay. That's ridiculous. Well, it took you a long time to, get to answer it. You were, I, mean, I know you're an attorney, but it took you a long time to answer it. Uh, l listen, I support the I-5 bridge. We need to get that thing built. Um, if you look at the funding sources and we just, you know, as Greg mentioned, we got, you know, one and a half billion dollars uh, by the feds just recently dedicated to it. If you look at all the federal and state funding sources that are going to go into that bridge, it will pay for the majority of the cost of that bridge. The tolling of that bridge will be probably the smallest aspect of the bridge. Okay. Yes. 
certainly there are concerns in terms of you know uh, families and individuals of lower socioeconomic statuses, and when they pay tolls, you know it represents a greater portion of their disposable income, and we certainly need to address that. There's no doubt, no doubt about that. The problem is, Greg's party, the MAGA party. They killed this thing the first time it came around, and they want to kill it again. You have a lot of his, uh, a lot of his uh, party members that are out there campaigning on it. They're campaigning on this is a boondoggle. They're campaigning on no tolls. They're campaigning on no libel. They are they are doing everything in their power to kill it again for the second time. And this is Greg's party, right? He knows he's going to take flack for supporting the bridge, but I I'm not going to hide from that. I support this bridge. And yes, tolls are a necessary component, and we should address the issues when it comes to people of lower socioeconomic standards or uh, statuses when it comes to paying tolls. Um, but it's not just a simple solution in terms of, you know, um, uh, our side of the toll. And we have a partner. We have another sovereign state, the state of Oregon, that also has their tolling mechanisms that they may or may not implement over the next 10 years, right? On their side of the of the river, and so uh, at the end of the day, most reasonable people in the 18th district, they get that that bridge needs to be replaced, and they get that at some point we will have to build a third bridge. But right now, what's in front of us, front and center, is that I-5 bridge, and we need to replace it, and we need to finish it. We need to get over the finish line. Thank you, Colleen. Right. Um, uh, great. We'll move on then. Um, take uh, one or two minutes. Give us your final pitch to voters. Feel free to mention any notable endorsements you would like to share. We'll start with Greg this time. Uh, sure. Well, I'm endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police, the local uh, IAFF 452 Fire uh, Union, uh, because of the work I've done around uh, uh, police, law enforcement, and in particular mental health in interventions. Um, I uh, very much appreciate their support. It's something I have a very much a passion for dealing with the mental health challenges, and that I think it, it, it affects our criminal systems, it affects our education systems, it affects what's happening in our homeless population. Um, it's it's a real passion that I have, and I'm just honored to have. I was named NAMI Washington uh, Behavioral Health Champion in 2023. Again, very proud of that uh, award because it's something I spend a lot of time and passion thinking about how do we how do we get around this this broad problem and what can we do to help these folks um and you know i i um i i, I tried to do real common sense things in the state legislature so i passed five bills uh, most of them were by a uh, 90 plus percent votes in the house uh, 45 out of 50 votes or so in the senate um and and so looking at things like simple things like Bipartisan, how do we uh, grow uh, transparency in our elections? How do we make sure that our elections data systems are appropriately talking to each other? Um, I passed a bill to remove unnecessary college degree requirements. Why? Because we know that there could be a young mom who's a great high school diploma, uh, who could be an awesome secretary, but if that job has a college degree required, um, well, that's gonna dissuade her from even applying, yet she could be an awesome uh, answering the phones while still maybe even doing it remotely and trying to parent a kid or something like that. So I'm trying to remove these barriers to the workforce entry so that we can get great jobs for people right here in Southwest Washington. I talked a little bit about what I did for the district in terms of capital budget and transportation budget in those projects. Um, again, I try to take a real common sense approach. Um, one of the things we haven't touched on um, that, uh, that I'm going to say again, and I've said it in public before, I think at the at the uh, Columbians uh, and the Vancouver Chamber of Commerce event, um, we've got to de-escalate the rhetoric here. Uh, we, we, we've got to get back to a place where we can have civil conversation, civil discussion with our opponents without name calling, without throwing unnecessary pejoratives. Um, that's something that I've done for a long time. Um, I, I defended uh, Adrian when that happened to him uh, publicly. I think it was in the reflector at the time. Um, and uh, that is something that I'm very intentional about is not throwing incendiary uh, name calling incendiary statements, uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all Americans, we're all Washingtonians. Um, I don't believe that that is, I, I believe the name calling and pejoratives are just simply unbecoming of us as public servants. It doesn't mean we can't have solid policy disagreements, that's fine. 
Um, but I've said it publicly and I'll continue to say that I'm not going to retreat from that position, which is civility matters. And we have to emulate civility. I try to do that for my two young boys. I think it is critically important, particularly in the last few weeks, to make sure that we are emulating the civility that we want to see. All right, thank you. Adrian, uh, final pitch and any endorsements? Yeah, so in terms of endorsements, I've been endorsed by several uh, very uh, honorable and worthwhile uh, uh, organizations, the Washington Education Association, uh, to name one, as far as uh, many uh, hardworking uh, labor organizations, uh, many community leaders, uh, both uh, present and former uh, elected officials. Uh, and so you can find all of the whole list of people that have endorsed me by going to my website, which is votecortez.com, and that's Cortez with an S. Um, look, uh, we need a community leader uh, that uh, ha is going to bring the right values to the Senate, right? We need somebody that has put in the time and the work and the energy and the effort, right? Uh, I believe that I have put in that time, put in that effort on a local level, on a regional level, and I believe that uh, I will take that same energy, that same passion, those same experiences uh, to the Senate uh, when I'm elected this fall. Uh, look, Greg is a great person. He's a great human being. He's just with the wrong party, right? When I was mayor and they protested in front of my house because they wanted me to pass an anti-mask, anti-vax uh, uh, ordinance in our community, there were over a hundred protesters from Patriot Prayer to Proud Boys. They descended on my personal residence, right? Um, then they were able to find out where my daughter played high school soccer and they descended on one of her soccer games. I have pictures of it. You have these big MAGA flags in the back and she's sitting here, you know, she's a goalie and she said, I mean, she, it really, it really, uh, you know, affected her. Um, Greg was right there. He came out and he put a press release, uh, including the, the then, at the time, chair of the uh, MAGA party. Um, and they both got lambasted for it. Actually, Greg got kicked out of the party for it, out of the local party for it, for doing that, for coming to my defense, right? And that's why he is not the endorsed candidate locally. Now, he may have state connections, but the state party doesn't necessarily represent the local rank and file here. Uh, he's just with the wrong party. It's not that he's a bad person, he's just with the wrong party. They don't support him. So if they don't support him, how effective is he gonna be up in Olympia? And this is not name calling, this is not using bad rhetoric, this is just a simple policy disagreement uh, that I have with him. Um, uh, I, I, I firmly believe that we need a voice up in Olympia that has stood up to the extremist agenda and is not afraid to stand up to that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for joining us.